We're really excited to be wrapping up season four of our History at Night program sponsored by the Friends of San Felipe de Austin State Historic Site. I'm the site manager here, Brian McCauley. If it's your first time, we are thrilled you're here. Uh, we had a lot of interest in this program, so I'm nervous there may be some folks still trying to get here. Hopefully they go ahead and come and don't be bothered if they wander in from the backside as we get rolling. Um, we started, I was telling Ernesto when he got here, we started this season in September with a colleague of his through the General Land Office who also does some work related to the Alamo. He manages the Spanish language collection. So if y'all were here in September and remember Dr. Stauffer, this is a nice bookend for us to kind of tie back up with the Alamo. I was privileged to make my first trip to Dawn at the Alamo in probably 20 years this year. So I was there in March and got a chance to see some of the new facilities and planning that they're doing that Ernesto is going to talk to you about. Um, I also had the privilege of meeting with some of our friends board tonight so any of you that are excited about supporting what's going on out here, I think you hear me say pretty regularly, I've got a donation box. I've got all kinds of things you can do to support us. Uh, we have events. We're planning for an annual membership drive in September. And if you want to celebrate Diaz y Seis at one of the most Spanish and Mexican Texas places you can, come see us here. And uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a nice moment on that Saturday where our friends are going to do a membership drive and a little fundraising and we're also opening a new exhibit, which I'll tell you a little about, about during my housekeeping. Mm -hmm. So I love talking about my friends group, and it always strikes me when I think about this. The nonprofit that is currently the Friends of San Felipe de Austin has had a lot of interesting iterations in their roller coaster ride of existence. Mm -hmm. But that button up at the top, that's actually a fake, that's a replica of the original button, but we have some of the originals too. In the 1920s, the local superintendent of schools had school kids raise nickels and dimes out of their fundraising money for lunch and the like, and they put the obelisk up across the street in 1928. So this organization is about 100 years old in terms of its interest as a stakeholder in the community. So it's always fun for me to be able to work with local, excited people who are involved in, in this project and in promoting local history. Um, some of you have heard me recently talk about the next phase for what we're doing here, which ironically enough, is going to be um, publicly funded. So a lot of this money that's for support is coming out of the sporting goods sales tax uh, monies that our agency is now receiving. And we are planning to go under construction in the next four to six months on a public archaeology lab. And I apologize, this picture isn't great, but there's some drawings of ghost buildings over here closer to me that represent a maintenance structure, uh, a retail warehouse for our division, retail operations. We've got one of the best stores in the system if you want to shop with us tonight. And then uh, a public archaeology lab that will allow future visitors who miss us doing excavations, which is most visitors, can then wander over to the lab, which will be open every day we're open, to see what we're finding and get a sense of what we're learning in that analysis process. So super excited about that and uh, hope that you'll enjoy it when we get there. So here's that slide showing you how we started and ended this year. and. Ernesto and I, he's a very busy guy at the Alamo. They've got a few things going on you all might have read about, so he's going to update you tonight. Um, I told him I was going to call his program Sent to San Felipe by Express, because that's one of the history references that connects our two sites, where William Travis writes his letter on February 24th and writes on the back of it to the messengers, get this to San Felipe. That's, that's the government. That's where the people are that need to know what's happening here. And I used to joke with a colleague of Ernesto's, Bruce Winders, who uh, previously had the senior curator job that Ernesto now holds, Bruce would talk about the letter when they would do their anniversary events around the siege every year. And a lot of times I was there, and uh, he would end his program frequently by saying, Travis's letter from the Alamo couldn't build an army to save the Alamo, but it built the, uh, the army that, that won the Battle of San Jacinto, right? And I would usually go up to Bruce and say, that is just so close to being totally right. If I, <laughs> if I just push it this one little bit. And the point I would always make to him, because that's an important part of the story we share here, is that very few people, certainly in that heady moment, saw Travis's manuscript letter. But a lot of people saw the broadside that the Gail Borden print shop operating here turned that letter into. So what I tell people, if they've heard Dr. Winder say that, is that the broadside of the Travis letter is what built the army that, that, that won San Jacinto. But anyway, we've been thrilled to have these guys here. I'm super excited. There's a connection to it coming up I'm going to share with you with the General Land Office. I'm also excited because Nicole, who was just in here, our lead educator, who hounds me about 
doing better at promoting this event and having a better schedule far in advance, she's delivering on a program for us for September. So this is one of our colleagues up at Fanthorpe Inn who works at the Washington the Brazos complex. His name is uh, Chandler Warman, who's been a very acclaimed interpreter and living historian, has gotten several awards in the last couple of years. He's doing a program on Henry Fanthorpe. And as we've thought about different ways to offer sessions here, we're planning for that program to take place primarily in our living history venue out in the via out there. So if you come see us in September on the 28th, you'd go out and interact with Chandler portraying, uh, portraying uh, Henry Fanthorpe. We might do a component on the front and back end in here where there's a Q&A and a setup or whatever, but it should be a lot of fun. So put that on your calendar. That's the start of season five for History at Night. I want to share, if you don't know my buddies up front, Frank and Mark, who are some of our longstanding volunteers, we're getting to the point where we're substantive enough and we're committed enough to the things we fund that we're doing the kind of things I always imagined really cool museums did and doing some outreach and forging partnerships that create some unique connections. So anybody guess where that picture is taken, either one of those pictures? You can probably figure out what's going on there. So if you've been out and seen our VIA, I was hoping I might confuse some of you into thinking that's our print shop, which of course it's not. Our print shop is in a log Air cabin. Air conditioning would throw you off. That's true there. <laughs> Mark, who's been out here this summer working the print shop in July and August with the camp kids and the like. Um, so you may not know the story of our donor. Well, I don't want to slip too far ahead. Um, we knew when we were planning for our exhibit that there was a working replica press in private hands in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we were struggling to get a press built. We were struggling to find a press that we could buy. We certainly had no imagining that someone would give us a press. But ultimately, that's the card we played. And the way we got there is that 30 years ago, John Horn, who's a, a printer nerd, the way that myself and others in this room are history nerds, John Horn, who is a printer by trade and a collector by passion, um, had motivated the curatorial staff at Historic Arkansas, the museum in downtown Little Rock, to help him build a working replica press. And he funded it, he bought the materials, he helped them do it, and in exchange, he asked them to build two so he could keep one and add it to his, what, 30,000 square foot warehouse of printing pieces. So it was one of dozens, if not hundreds, of presses that, uh, that he owns. And so we finally asked John, what would it take, because our time's running out, to get you to give us that press? And uh, interestingly, he was motivated by our promise to use the press. So without Frank and Mark coming out every week and without us using our press for school programs and my staff learning how to do this, we would have upset a donor that we really needed to cultivate. So we took a trip to Little Rock in June. I loaded the boys up and we put on the clothes and went to Little Rock and talked Texas history. And I included, you'll notice the lady in the picture on the right, she's wearing an Astros jersey, right? <laughs> so we drove all the way to Little Rock so that Frank could meet up with an old friend of his from his politicking days back in Houston, who was there with their family the day we were interpreting printing. And then because we're all Longhorn alum, we decided to rub it into our, our Razorback <laughs> friends by having a little moment there. We're not even messing with you Aggies, calm down. Yeah. This is an Arkansas thing. <laughs> so this is the... There you go. So this is the donor, and so the picture there in the bottom was when Michael Moore and I went up two years ago to pick up the press when we made the deal, and then Frank and uh, Mark and I got a chance to spend half a day with John as part of this trip, helping us understand some of what we're trying to do. Super excited. There'd been some miscommunication. We hadn't had a chance to really kiss the ring with the donor until this trip and make sure he was hearing about what we're doing. So John is going to host a week-long workshop for us, which I can assure these guys will be very intensive. We're gonna, we're gonna learn a bunch of stuff we didn't know we didn't know and uh, have some fun in John's warehouse. So there's a picture of it. You can't see all the presses, but it's a massive space. All that to say, um, we're also planning for this bicentennial exhibit. So I mentioned the Friends having their membership drive on the 16th of September. That same day, we're gonna officially open a new temporary exhibit that'll be about the bicentennial of the founding of this town. So we've been talking for a number of years that San Felipe being a founding era site gives us the benefit of getting out front on this bicentennial story that I assume you're going to hear a lot about for the next 13 years as we march towards 2036. So not only that, we're going to do two bicentennials for the price of one when you come see this exhibit. We're going to keep it open from mid-September 
if I can get it installed in the next seven weeks, um, until Labor Day of next year. And so it starts with the bicentennial, the founding of the town in the fall of 1823. And then by next summer, we'll be commemorating the issuing of the first land grants in Austin's colony, which went out to the people whose names are over there on the wall, the, the old 300, and we've got some old 300 descendants here tonight. So that'll be an, an exciting way to bookend this exhibit and tell some really exciting bicentennial stories. But to prove to you we're working on it, this is actually a, this is a cutout from our draft of the exhibit. So we're gonna be using the very famous McCardle painting, if you know it, of Stephen F. Austin in the log cabin to express the different themes we're celebrating. So here's that day again, September 16th. Come plan to be here with us. I put a date on the reception. We're not even sure we're having a reception, but the board and I met today, we'll get all the details out as we get closer. You'll definitely be able to come here and uh, renew your membership, become a member, help us with fundraising. Sorry, Yvonne, I did use the word garage sale. I promised him that I wouldn't. It's not really a garage sale, but we are gonna sell some stuff. We are gonna sell some stuff. So I don't really need any questions, but that's always my closing slide. Super excited to introduce Ernesto Rodriguez to you tonight, who I've known for many years through our connections to the Alamo. And uh, you know, it's really important that all of our sites that are going through these growth spurts and figuring out what we're gonna be when we grow up are managing different connections and different points of access. So it was a little fun on my part to use that title to send this to St. Fleetwood by Express. But our visitors are really excited when they learn that we have connections to William Travis and to Santa Ana and that we have a war government here pretending like they can navigate all this crazy that's going on out there in the field as the Texas Revolution is playing out. Um, Ernesto is a San Antonio native. I think you told me when you got here you've been at the Alamo for 24 years. Is that right? 24 years. So super excited. He is very much the institutional knowledge of what's been happening at that institute now for the last two and a half decades. And he's going to be sharing with you some of the fun stuff that they're working on. Let me get your program pulled up. The driver is the buttons on the right move you forward. Of course, I'm the tech guy, which could be bad news for everybody. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> that one. We wanted the first slide, right? Yes, I think so. The one right before that is the intro that just says the Alamo on it, but that's fine. This is the first real slide. All right, cool. So once again, um, I'm Ernesto Rodriguez. I am the senior curator and historian of the site. I've been there, it'll be 24 years, September 7th. Um, when they tell people, always get on the bus when they're leaving after a field trip, listen. <coughs> I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm just, no. no it's, uh, it's been a wonderful 24 years. Um, I've seen a lot of things change over the 24 years, and it's one of those things that I'm, I'm privileged to be at a site right now that has gone through so many different growth spurts, I should say. And so in the last, uh, the last couple of years, we've expanded our interpretation. And so one of the things that we did first was we brought out two four-pounders. We, we found a company that was reproducing cannons for uh, some cannons, and one of the cannons they were reproducing was a four-pounder from the Alamo. And someone asked, well, how do we know that that's it? And I said, well, we had someone ask questions about what the measurements of a cannon was, and I gave them the measurements because <laughs> I measured it. And uh, he went home, made a pattern, sent it to a guy in Idaho, and uh, traded the pattern that he made for a cannon, and then they produced more artillery pieces. So we said, why don't we start with that? And so if you walk into the plaza, there are two cannons right on the floor, on the front of the, right in front of the church, well, not in front of the church, but directly in front. And uh, that's how we started this new phase. And we were in the middle of, of a master plan, and so those two cannons brought so much wonderful attention to our site that they said, well, why don't you do more? And we had proposed an 18 pounder project. And uh, they had said, well, I don't know about that because uh, that's a big project. Well, after the two cannons were set in place, they said, go for it. So we started researching. And the 18 pounder is a cannon that ties both San Felipe to the Alamo because the person that fires that gun is William Barry Travis. So we start doing research on it, and in doing this research, we discover that there's not a lot known about this gun. There's a few photos of it, 
But that's about it. We know it's an 18 pounder in caliber, but what did it actually look like? So we went to the photos that we know. And in looking at the photos, there's one that's in front of the church in 1858. There's a wonderful image of it in front of the church. And the muzzle was missing. <laughs> and so then it reappears at San Pedro Springs Park because it was sent to that park to be a decoration. And so there's a few photos there. And there's one photo in particular where there's a gentleman sitting on the cannon. And, his, and we found out who that gentleman was. His name was Fernando Raven. We found his draft card for World War I. So we had his height. We went to the park and we found the plinth the cannon had been sitting on. So we got people that are good at math. <laughs> and they went out and they measured the plinth. They took his height, put it into a computer program, and they were able to figure out the true size of the artillery piece. It was not actually a six, it was not an 18 pounder. It's probably started its life out as a nine pounder that was bored out to become an 18 pounder. Yeah. So there's descriptions of the thing of the cannon being fired. It's a lively gun. Well, yeah, because it's been <laughs> cut, so it jumps up and down. <laughs> now, the thing about that artillery piece is that we can't we we were working on it, and so it was myself and a colleague named Colby. Both of us are working on this thing. And one night, he, he texts me in the middle of the night and says, I think I found an image of one of these guns. And it was at the at a uh, Royal Artillery Museum. And so he's looking at this thing, and he goes, There's so, you know, we need to contact this person. And the person they con we contacted was Ruth Brown, the foremost authority on artillery pieces. And she's out of England. And so he started talking to her. And she says, yeah, you know, that gun that you had, that the gun we have in one of our royal armories is Swedish. <laughs> so the story was that it was an English gun. No, it's actually Swedish. <laughs> and so it takes you to this a different direction now because the Alamo now has Swedish guns. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, where do these come from? Other than Sweden, right? And so when you start looking, well, there was a big thing where Britain was no longer producing f artillery pieces for the mass market because they were fighting with everybody. You don't arm your enemies. And so Sweden had a lot of really good iron. And so they start mining it. They start producing <coughs> artillery pieces for the mass market. And these are insurance guns. The more guns your ship has, the less t levy or tax you pay. And so these were insurance guns. And so as we're doing our research, we figure this out. We now have the, the thing is we've, it's a, it's a nine pounder that's been bored out to be an 18. Now we have to get this thing cast. And so we start looking. And this is right before we hit COVID. And so we wanted to get it cast in Texas. And we talked to many, many foundries. Unfortunately, some of the ones we were looking at that could cast a cannon that size did not survive. But I will say that of all the founders we talked to, there was only, only one foundry that said, you need cannonballs? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, that one was here in Texas. Uh, well, it ends up getting cast in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, by the Vernon Bell Foundry. And they've been in business since only uh, 1842. Same family is still running it. And so now we have to get this pattern to Verdon. And, and so we get a phone call, because that's how this works. We typically get a phone call, hey, guess what you're doing? And uh, we got the phone call on the 30th of December. And they said, hey, you're traveling on the 1st of January to go deliver this thing. So we did, we drove all the way Cincinnati dropped off the pattern. The pattern was cast. It was then sent to a carriage maker out of South Dakota. They produced a carriage. We then drove to South Dakota in a minivan with a foam pattern, the same exact pattern that was sent to Verdon. We take it with us and we're sh shooting videos along the way at different places and talking about artillery pieces. People would see us walking out with this gigantic cannon and they were, they were like, is it real? And you're like, yeah, we're from Texas. Yeah. Uh, and so we finally, we get to the final product and we're driving home to, after looking at it and we stop at another sister site in Goliad. Mm -hmm. And they have two artillery pieces out in the, in the park right outside this, off the square. 
and uh, Scott met us out there, Scott McMahon, and uh, we take the pattern out, we walk over, and we put the pattern on top of the nine pounder, and it's an exact match. <laughs> we did our job. Oh, wow. And those, that gun that's there, the two guns in that park are actually sent from the Alamo to Goliad to try to help them. And so we were able to complete the process. We then created an exhibit. And this exhibit is the, uh, the, basically it's the 18 pounder exhibit. We built a replica sort of of what we think it looked like. It's, a, it's an interpretation of the corner and we put this artillery piece on there and I will say every artillery piece that we've had made is fully functional. We are not going to make something that we can't use. <laughs> and so, so that was that gets us into that phase. Then they said, what else can we do? So we built the palisade, a section of the palisade was erected. And as that was starting, we started moving and looking ahead at how to preserve our collection. Because the most important thing we have, other than object, the artifacts one and two, is the large collection of artifacts that we have in our vault. And so we started working on the collection center and we were able to open this up on March 2nd as the Ralston Family Collection Center. And um, this building houses an exhibit at this moment that is called The Collector's Journey. And when we started on this, someone said, why don't y'all do a Phil Collins exhibit? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we have more to offer. Mm -hmm. Things people have never seen. So we changed it to a collector's journey. So you can follow how people collect. And it focuses on our collections. So you've got the Phil Collins Texana collection. You have the Donald and Louisiana Spanish Colonial collection. And then we have the Dollars of the of Texas and Descendants collection. And so we're showcasing those four collections so that people can see how we collect. And so when you walk into this building, there's a wonderful wall right in the, where all the glass is. There's a wonderful wall that it showcases a snapshot of everything we have from indigenous all the way to commemorative and everything in between. So if you all come visit, you'll get to see at least three Crockett rifles, one Vest Parker rifle, and everything in between. And so this was really exciting because in all my years of working there, we had talked about having a place for us to be able to showcase more items. And we were finally able to do it through this structure. My office is actually located in that building now. And so I'm excited because we just did something that I thought would never happen. We moved our collection into this new structure. So it's all in that building now. And it's, uh, it's wonderful. I'm not just saying that because I work there. Where, where is this? It, this is at the Alamo at the back. OK, you said the top right? Uh, that's on the bottom right. Yeah. 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 Well, we say everything's bigger in Texas. Why not? Well, yeah, well, and that's the thing that uh, what's really interesting is top right, top right. Yeah. It's angry. <laughs> So what we're also doing is, uh, the next slide is actually an image of the inside of this building. And uh, take my word for it, it's cool. Uh, now it's a really, that was different. Do I have another right picture? There. This is the second floor. It has two stories. This is a, a, just a, a quick view of some of the guns. But in this building, you will also see a diorama that's narrated by Phil Collins. And um, it's massive. We also started a new project, and it's a Defender project. And what we did was we, we went and got together with the Daughters of the Republic of Texas and the Sons of the Republic of Texas and any descendant groups. And we asked them for images of the descendants of Alamo Defenders. And we just want images of anybody that's directly connected. And we were able to produce... At this moment, we have three images of defenders. And so we received the, the ones that we had the most information on. We were able to send them to a forensic artist to bring the people to life. Because when we talk about the Alamo defenders, when we talk about the old 300, it's hard for a lot of people to visualize them as people because you're reading about them in the past. But when you see a visual representation, 
-hmm. it sort of changes it. And so we worked on that. So we have uh, an image of Lasoy of Esparza, an image of uh, Jonathan Lindley, and uh, we have an image of James Butler Bonham. And one of the things about Bonham is that he doesn't have dark hair. He's blonde hair. He's light hair. And there's an image of his brother that was a state official, and he has blonde hair. And so it's a portrait done in life. So the forensic artist, in doing her work, she said, no, he has blonde hair. And we actually had family members look at the image, and one of the family members said, that's the Bonham forehead, that's the Bonham brow, that's the Bonham nose. So again, we were happy that we were able to do something right. And so the one that we're working on right now is King, William Philip King, the youngest of the youngest of defenders. And so we're really excited because we're able to connect to the young people because this is a young guy, 15 years old. <laughs> we can move on to the next one. So this is the other fun project we were working on. So we decided to uh, figure out a way to let people know that you are at the Alamo. And the best way to do it is through the main, the mission gate and lunette. So the, when you came into the property, you would go through the main gate. And we decided, let's try to recreate it in the best form possible. So this is an artist's interpretation of what the main gate looked like. And you'll see that the right in the, on the top image, you've got the lunette. And now, it's not finished at, in this point because he had to come back and stain. He's doing that now. And I'm going to tell you that it looks like dirt. It looks like wood. He's a master at, you know, I won't use a French term because he doesn't like to use it, but he's a master at arte rustico, rustic art. And he's a, he can make wood out of concrete dirt out of concrete. And so this artist, his name is Carlos Cortez, and he's been working with us. We worked on getting the measurements because we do have the measurements for the main gate. A Spanish priest actually measured the main gate. And so we know what the main gate's measurements were. We don't know what it actually looked like. We've talked to people and they're like, well, I know what it looked like. I looked at a photo that was done, you know, of an image that was done in 1970. <laughs> and you're like, well, it's, it wasn't there. And so we took the measurements and we were able to produce this. Now, it's a little shorter than it should be because if it was a full height, it's about a less than a foot. It's less than a foot shorter. But if we did the full height, then it might cover up the thing people go see. The church. And so the way that we did this too is that there is an opening at the front of the lunette there wouldn't have been one in 1836, but in order to have the amount of people that come to visit us go through, we had to provide more entrances than it had. But it's really a neat exhibit. One of the things that we're, we're working on right now is that, like I said, they're painting the, they're painting the structures, they were whitewashing the gate, and we're installing the Phil Collins dioramas that we have inside so that you can follow a timeline and learn as you go. And so it's really, it's an exciting time to be here at the Alamo because of that structure coming up. And it actually gives you a place of sight. You walk through and you know you're somewhere important as you go through that gate. Now, I wouldn't recommend it right now because it's hot. <laughs> but, but it is a wonderful piece of, uh, a wonderful artistic piece for us to be able to interpret. Now... In between this slide and what's going to happen next, there's a, I don't have a slide for that because I don't have a rendition of that, but we are also building a new education center. And this education center is, is going to provide a place for the students of Texas to be able to learn about the Texas Revolution and be able to be brought through, funneled into a, a place where they can get that first idea of what the site is before they go and wander through. So we're trying to capture the minds and imaginations of the youth so that they can be the ones that take over when we are no longer here and take care of the site. We can move to the next one. Here's where it gets fun. So this is, this is, this is my last slide. Uh, this is a new, or will be, hopefully, the new visitor center and museum. 
This will be, if you've been to the Alamo, you will see that across the street, we have the Woolworth building, yeah. the Palace building, the Crockett building. Mm -hmm. So in those structures, they will be constructing a, a, a museum that is going to be over 100,000 square feet. They will be adding a sec another floor to the top that will provide a venue for events that ha will have the best view in Texas of my office, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> no, of, the, of the Alamo Church. And we are also going to have a 4D theater. And that 4D theater is going to be amazing from what I've seen. It'll, they showed us a little, a pro, one of the products and they can make it look like there's fire inside the building and ashes falling from the sky. And it's a, it was just incredible. They set it up at the, at the convention center for us to see this thing and it was amazing. Now there's a, we have it slated at the moment to have eight galleries. So you'll start with the indigenous period and work your way through. And as you're working your way through, you will get to the biggest of the galleries, which is the Battle of the Alamo Gallery. And then you keep going and you'll end up with how we remember. There was also plans for on the Woolworth side at the old lunch counter to set up a civil rights exhibit at the lunch counter that talks about the civil rights movement in San Antonio. Because unlike other places, our lunch counters desegregated peacefully in March of 1960. The businesses got together and said, let's not have a sit-in, let's just open up. And so we're doing that as well because our job is to connect the dots. All history is connected. Nothing happens in a vacuum. And so our job is to connect all the dots to make the story more important to the visitor. We are basically weaving a tapestry of the history of not only the Alamo, but the Texas Revolution. And what we're working on is on ways to be able to use our site, which is a magnet for visitors, to be able to support sites like San Felipe, Goliad, San Jacinto, because we get the people, and if we do our job right, they will come visit the other sites, mm -hmm. because that's why we're here. We're here to help each other because the story of Texas is not a story of one site. Mm -hmm. It's a story of many sites. It's a story of people united together for one common goal. I like to tell people all the time that when you think about that Texan mentality, it starts with a little mission on the banks of the San Antonio River as a spark in which people need to rely on each other. Neighbors come together to help neighbors. That's what's happening in San Antonio. That little spark will grow into a flame in 1836. Unfortunately, the flame at the Alamo is extinguished, but then out of the ashes of defeat rises a phoenix, so will be the Republic of Texas. And as we all know, in times of trouble, who do they count on to come and help them? Texas. Texas, right? No one ever says, thank God Maine's here. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to the people from Maine, but but that's it. It's a Texan mentality, and it's born out of necessity, and it's what is ingrained in us. It's what we are. We are a people that go and support our neighbors, and the Alamo is trying to do the same thing. We're able to help our neighbors, and we will continue to do so. Now, when we look at the Battle of the Alamo, 1836, um, you have letters that are being written by one of the citizens of San Felipe asking for help. William Barry Travis is asking for help. And like Brian said, the letter gets here and no one really saw the handwritten copy. They saw the printed version from Gail Borden. And uh, at the Alamo, you can go see the original letter written by William Barry Travis, or I mean, Stephen F. Austin, I should say, prior to the outbreak of hostilities where he says, war is our only resource. We have the original letter that was sent to Gail Borden, who then wrote a note on the outside of the letter that says, for my son, Stephen F. Austin Borden. <laughs> now, I don't think he got it, because we have it. <laughs> uh, but William Barry Travis will write a letter. And it's, you know, the letter that we all know as to the people of Texas, all Americans in the world. Now, that letter will change the course of history, and I do ask for one favor. If you ever recite that letter, please stop at victory or death. You have your audience captured. If you go to the postscript, you lose them because it's a shopping list. <laughs> and, and so I was at an event where everyone was so excited as they were listening to this letter, 
And it's like, victory or death. P.S. We have 30 heads of beeves. We have some... <laughs> <laughs> and so they lost them. But there's a, that connection is coming back and forth, right? Who's, who responds to the letter? People of Texas start moving. Now, again, how do they move? On foot or on horseback, not in a car. You know, they wouldn't be able to make the trek that we made as fast. And so they start coming to the aid. The other thing that's happening at the same time is that there's a gentleman by the name of Three-Legged Willie that responds to a letter. And unfortunately, that letter is in some Mexican archive somewhere. It's been translated, and it says, for God's sake, hold on, help us on the way. And so Three-Legged Willie has responded. And so there's that connection. Prior to that, when we're talking about the old 300, well, there's a government official here. Guess where he's from? San Antonio. You know, you have Gaspar Flores that signs so many things for uh, with Stephen F. Austin or Esteban as he was writing in the registro. So there's that big connection. And it's important that we keep that connection alive because as the Alamo moves forward, San Felipe moves forward, we're all moving in the same direction, which is to be able to educate the public in our wonderful history of this, not only our sites, but in the history of Texas. It just so happens that we do it on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. We're educators to the masses. And so, as we continue moving, we have to move in that direction. Now, it depends on how much more you want me to talk, or, your, or do you want to well, do some special? Is there anything else that you want to add? Before? Well, what I will say is that, um, coming soon, soon. <laughs> um, so this, this structure is slated to open if everything goes well in 2027. And so we're really moving in that direction. Uh, we just had a wonderful event at the Alamo last weekend, and it was the Camel Corps came to visit because in the 1850s, the U.S. Army decided that it would be a great idea to bring camels to Texas and the West, and they came through the Alamo, and they, so we had them this weekend. Uh, we're gearing up while, uh, after you all do your event, we're having a big event. It's Tejano Day at the Alamo. And so we're going to have a big thing where we're talking about the Tejano population and their contributions to Texas. So we'll be doing that on the 23rd of September. But um, we do hope you all come by and visit. We're there all week. <laughs> Sometimes more. Um, and we're, we're lucky, though, because right now all of the stars have aligned. And so we are all working together for a common goal. And it's what's best for the state of Texas. And so we're excited because in the 20, going on 24 years, this is a time that I can see that all of the bonds are being formed that will get us to where we need to be so that future generations will come and love this, our state, as much as we do. And that's one of the most important things we can do. Any questions? I'll start with Brian, because I think he has That is the last slide, right? Yes, it is. No, I just want to add one thing, and I appreciate you all being here, and you don't necessarily know this, and I'm not here to whine about it. We tried to predict what kind of visitation a site like this would have when we were planning to open it in 2018. And I was on the very optimistic side, although I certainly understood some of the challenges. And I'll be frank in saying, our visitation is about half what we would have hoped it would be right now. COVID's a weird factor. It's hard to know what that means. But what we certainly have learned and I knew this when we opened five years ago, we're not on the tourism radar yet. We're mostly on the radar of people who love Texas or who live regionally or who, know that, who knew that there were parts of the story that had not ever really been fleshed out. You know, we're latecomers to the party. But I was telling Ernesto earlier, and I've sort of been telling my stakeholders for the last really three to five years, there are gonna be more visitors who find us over the next decade because they read about us the first time at the Alamo or at San Jacinto, or at Washington, the Brazos. So that's gonna be the dynamic that changes as we do more of this partnership. And then I'm gonna tell them myself before I take your questions. Some of you were here last month when we had Ken Wise, I think a few of you joined us for that. And I might have said something that I thought was really smart about Ernesto coming this month. And now I've learned it might have been really stupid, but I'll share with you. When I went to the Alamo and saw that collection in March, when I was telling you that story, I ran into Ernesto briefly, and he was too kind to tell me I was an idiot then. And I was championing him for having put up in big, bold letters, 
an argument that I made here about a Stephen F. Austin letter that he referenced, a war is our only resource, which I was trying to convince my team the handwriting is screwy and the word is recourse. And when I saw the document room, that's what it says on the wall. It says war is our only recourse. So I was clapping him on the back for getting it right. Because I told our team, I lost this vote four to one in my exhibit team. They said, sit down and shut up. You got this wrong. And so that's we, we interpreted resource, which Ernesto would tell you is right. Last month, I told you all he was going to come. And he's the guy that got it right. He put it on recourse. And actually, he's just telling me that I'm the guy that screwed it up. I'm the idiot on this and can't read the handwriting. So they're getting theirs fixed. When you see it, it'll say resource, right? Yeah. And, and they'll have it all correct. So whatever it is, it was a heady moment for Stephen F. Austin to be writing about going to war in Texas. Um, I'm going to let you guys ask questions before I throw any softballs at him about our sites. You had a question, sir. Yeah, I just wondered how uh, Phil Collins got interested in Alamo and how y'all talked him into donating his collection. <laughs> so Phil Collins, um, he was watching Davy Crockett, King of the Law Frontier, when he was a little boy. And he fell in love with the show. Now you can imagine, he's in England, he's watching this thing, and he says, basically, he would play Alamo when his friends were playing, playing cowboys. Right. Yeah. He thought it was his own little thing. And so he read the Walter Lord's book when it came out. He saw John Wayne's movie. And so he became more and more enamored with the story. But that's where it stayed. When he was on tour, um, he picked, they, they were on a, on a break, and so some of the band members were traveling together and they were able to pick a place they wanted to go without the rest complaining. He picked the Alamo and he could describe how he saw it for the first time and his bucket list item he visited for the first time in the early 80s. And um, he fell in really in love with the site. Then he traveled and he went to Georgetown and he saw this antique store and it had a document that said David Crockett. And he looked at it and said, wow, it exists. That was it. A few years later, he was given a gift, and it was a saddle receipt for John W. Smith. And the minute he got that receipt, he started collecting everything and anything Texas Revolution related. And so he amassed one of the largest collections of Texana outside of the United States. It was in his chateau in Switzerland. So then he decided that um, after enjoying it for many years, he wanted someone else to enjoy it. Now, he's been coming to the Alamo off and on for decades and so I've known him since 2004 and so one day he came and he asked uh, General Land Office would y'all be interested in my collection and they said yes and so for six months we worked on it without anybody knowing what we were doing because it was such a big thing we were waiting for the big announcement and in 2014 the Phil Collins Texana collection came to the Alamo wow. I will say he's very, a very humble individual. If you ever get to see him, say hello. He will, he will stop and talk to you. And uh, he narrates the uh, diorama, the diorama exhibit in the new, in the, in the new facility, the collection facility. It's really well done, and it, it's very passionate. I think yeah. you'll be touched by it when you see it. And I can't confirm this because I haven't talked to Phil about it ever. But I'm told he's been here before, that someone who's chasing the Alamo and Revolution stories has come out and prowled the Travis haunting grounds long before this building was here. So this would have been years ago, the way people would look at the old uh, grounds across the way. Um, you know, many of us in the industry had a little heads up on this story. And I'm sure I've shared with some of you, we talked about Dr. Stouffer earlier, Stouffer, sorry. Um, the GLO holds the collection that really is the core of our story. Our document story is in their collection, all the land grant documents, all the things Stephen F. Austin was pushing. And so I remember going to uh, the deputy, I'm sorry, the director of archives office, Mark Lambert, years ago with Phil Collins' coffee table book and pointing out things that had San Felipe associations, very specifically a sword that was collected by one of Gail Borden's print partners, uh, a guy named uh, jo uh, Jonathan Baker, Joseph Baker, sorry, Joseph Baker, who's a translator for the newspaper. So that collection touches a lot of interesting places. It's going to be a really fascinating addition to the to the history world. And then, uh, was that all of your question? Did you get it all? All right. Go ahead. We were on a tour with some out-of-towners to the Alamo a couple of years ago, and the tour guide never mentioned the story about the lion in the sand. Is that now <laughs> thought to be untrue, or what's the status of that? So it's legend. 
And so, but as the, most of the stories at the Alamo there, no one, no one survived that was a true combatant for the entire battle on the Texan side. So our stories come from people that are the disenfranchised. And that's one of those really neat things because the basis for our story is a slave narrative from Joe. Doesn't mention the lion story. He was there. You have uh, Susanna Dickinson, Enrique Esparza, Juan Navarro de Ellsbury. So we get all of the survivors' accounts, but none of them mention the lion story. William Physic Zuber mentions the lion story. And unfortunately, he will then say, you know, he embellished parts, left parts out. So never tells us what he actually embellished. And so unfortunately, could it have happened? Yes. Did it happen before? Yes. And it's important to note that story from Zuber really emerges about 20 years after the battle. Well, <coughs> almost 40. Yeah, all right. So. Yeah. And so one of the defenses that, that I've heard him had, that he used when someone questioned him about it, he said, are you calling my mom a liar? Um, that was one of the defenses. But one of the things about the story is that it adds to it. Now, if you look back, there was a book that was written in the early, late 1820s, early 1830s, and it was about Pizarro and the conquest of the Incas, and guess what Pizarro does? Draws a line in the sand. Who read that book? Ah. Travis. There's also a line in the sand story at the Battle of Bear. Benjamin Milam draws a line with the butt of a rifle. He said he draws it, who will go with Ben Milam into San Antonio. So line stories do happen. But are we sure that ours happen? No. So, so that's why it's, it's typically when they do mention it, it's legend has it, because that's what it is. But it's an important part of our story as the legend, because that tells you they made a choice to stay. <coughs> yes, sir? Do you access your collection center through the Alamo, or do you have a separate entrance? You go straight through the front of the church, all the way to the back. There is a fee to go into the collection center. And so you go right back, you can purchase tickets right outside. We have a person stationed there that sells tickets. And um, I do recommend that you all come visit it because, not because I worked on it, but <laughs> no, it's actually a very interesting exhibit because we are able to showcase on the welcome wall itself. We have more objects on display than we had on display in our old museum. So on one wall. So you get to see more of the collection than you've ever seen before. There's a really in interesting digital table upstairs <coughs> that is still being added to, and it's up being updated. And uh, one of the biggest updates we're waiting for is the ability for the visitor to curate their own collection of Alamo artifacts, and you can email them to yourself. We're waiting for that component to be completed. There's a wall, you know, we have photo people that take pictures out front. Well. Your photo, when, it, when they take a picture of you, it appears inside the collection center on the wall of visitors that are, have visited. We have an actual wall of photos, including dignitaries that have visited, and then all of a sudden the visitor or guest sees this image of themselves and they're like, oh, we're part of the exhibit. So it's a really nice component to add to it. And then we have a document room. And the document room is where you see some of the most, more in, on my side, because I'm a history person, documents is where the soul is located. And so when you, you can read a lot of these things from James Bowie's citizenship document to the letter that is written by Travis that he wants to be a citizen of San Felipe. We have that on display. So we have a lot of wonderful documents on display and some wonderful artwork. We just, uh, we were able to put up the, uh, the McCardle who will go with Oban Milam painting. So it's on a wall now for, the, for our, our guests to see. We also are displaying John Wayne's original movie art. It's on display in how people remember. And it's a, it's a pilgrimage piece. We've had people come from all over the world looking for that painting, and a lot of times they couldn't see it because it was in our vault. It's on display now for people to see. Yeah. I had to Google forensic artists in 4D. <laughs> so, Oh. So when I Google forensic artists and just talk about police work, so can mm -hmm. you elaborate? So, complete so, what a for, so a forensic artist, what they do is that they, they take images and they try to recreate a person, either age regression or just try to make them so people can see them. Now, the forensic artists we're using is out of Houston. And um, 
she has been able to help the police police departments basically solve so many crimes with her art. Mm -hmm. And so she does a very good job. So what she does is she takes images and she basically looks at them all and she makes a, a painting as to what an individual would look like through the characteristics of all the descendants. So she's able to do that. And so it's a really interesting process. And so when, when uh, she did the ones, the the Esparza painting, we had the Esparzas come visit. And one of them walked up, and he's actually still an Esparza. You know, he's he follows the Esparza line of the male being Esparza. And uh, he stood there, and he's, he asked his son, to, another Esparza, take my photo, and he took his hat off. And from here up, it's him. And I'm looking at him going like, wow. You know, you look just like the painting. And he's like, yeah, we didn't send the photo myself. <laughs> so she did a really good job. Now 4D, you know, you know 3D with the the things popping up. And 4D had the other element of wind, smoke, being actually touched. And uh, so we're adding, it's that element. It's so a fourth element, the fourth dimension that you're going to get in this theater. So, the, so you've done the spirit theater at the Bullock. Yeah. They do some of that, some of that component. So. so it'll shake and do all that. Uh, yeah, uh, 2027 is the finish date for mm -hmm. the visitor center. How much more of the overall renovation do you expect to have done by that time? By when this is when this is completed, this will this will be the capstone for the entire project. And so we're we're working really hard. And the other things that are involved is the plazas. We're working and we're phasing the plazas into or getting the plazas. I should say, Alamo Street is slated to shut down next week completely so that we can move in, actually make it pedestrian friendly and uh, make it a place where visitors will come and gather, make it a gathering point. There's trees that are being moved back and forth. So if you go today, there's a tree in the middle of the street and they're working hard to keep that tree healthy, which is the <laughs> most interesting thing to see. But we're trying to make it so that when you come to visit, it feels comfortable, it's inviting, and so we're making it so that you're going to a place and you know you're at a site that means something. And so there'll be shops as well that'll help um, to feed our visitors and things like that. The gift shop in this building is gonna be amazing. And, uh, but that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to incorporate all the plazas. The education center will, is uh, going to be in the area where the DRT library once stood. We're going to try to do that in order to be able to enhance the experience. So there's a lot of little projects, but they're all supposed to culminate in 2027 with the grand opening of this building. Will you move your exhibits into this building? Oh, yeah, a lot of them are going to move in. And then we're going to turn the building that we're in now into a rotating exhibit space so that we can showcase other collections that we have or just bring exhibits in from outside because our goal is to be able to continue to educate people <coughs> the, uh, to the best of our ability because we do get 1.5 million visitors a year. Yeah, and so we do things on a grand scale. Go ahead, Peter. I was gonna ask, it's been years since I've been to the Alamo, we're certainly gonna go back. Is there one particular uh, uh, artifact that sticks out in your mind, something that you're extra proud of? Mm -hmm. There's actually two. <laughs> and when you arrive at the Alamo, was as soon as you get there, you look at it, and it's the church and the lawn bearer. Okay. Artifact one and two. And uh, those are the two most important pieces in our collection. And uh, without those two, we don't have a site. You know, and so when it's, it's really important that we care for those two artifacts. Those are, those are my two favorite artifacts. They, they got to tie the whole thing together. <laughs> and so and the people, sometimes I get asked, well, no, I mean, like, little things. Yeah. And they're like, oh, okay. Because yeah. I'm thinking, you said artifacts, I'm thinking big ones. Very true. Peter. Um, I know you're talking about the finalization of 2027, um, but say fast forward 20, 30 years from now, is there an interest in keep on reclaiming the original footprint of so, the animal site? So what's going to end up happening is we will have control of almost the entire footprint of the Alamo. Now, in the old days, they would rebuild and make it look the way people think it should look. We don't know what it looked like. That's why our main gate is an artist's rendition. We're interpreting the site. Unfortunately, we will, the way things are, we will never rebuild anything to make it look like something that we don't know. 
what we are doing is finding ways to interpret different areas. Now, there's one spot of land that we will probably never get, federal land, because it sits on like prime real estate. <laughs> but uh, we're going to be able to interpret that side too, to a certain extent. So we are going to be able to showcase the entire, what is the old layout of the Alamo itself, or because we also get asked, you know, why don't you recreate the entire battlefield? And what's the response to that? Well, we have to tear down all of downtown. <laughs> and they're like, no, just the battlefield. <laughs> all of downtown, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was. And so you can think about all the things, you know, we'd have to get rid of a lot of hotels. And then where are people going to stay? Uh, we have to rerun the river the way it once was and, and get rid of the, uh, the big, uh, we have to get rid of the big canal that actually keeps us from flooding. So if you ever go downtown and there's a heavy rain, safest place to be is the river walk. It'll never go above four feet <laughs> because we have, uh, there's two tunnels that run under downtown that take the water away. And so, yeah, the Corps of Engineers did something really great after the flood of 1920. So, Yes, sir. You know, one of the most interesting things that always peaks my mind is the doors of the Alamo. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are the chances that they exist? What are the chances you'll find them? Yeah, I know you've got the governor's mansion, you've got the borough house, you've got all the your parts. Uh, doors of the Alamo, what are the chances? So there, there is a set of doors to that, that is at the Bob Bullock Museum that were found on the property of the Herrera family that are believed to have been the main gate doors. Which family? Herrera. 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 Yeah, and so they're right, they're, they're on display now. They were found on their property, and they believe those may have been the Alamo doors for the main gate. So are they? We're not too sure, but... They believe they may be, and it's not a it's not a solid door. It's you know basically it's like a a trellis type thing, but it's thick and small. But you know that's that's one thing they found. Now a lot of the things that we have to remember is that after the Battle of the Alamo, things that were there, Mexican Army burned some of them to destroy any defensive positions, and so they destroy fortifications. And so when working on the main gate. One of the things that I that I found was that that main gate area was still there up to 1871, when the city of San Antonio purchased the land and tore it down because it was flooding. And so, you know, you think about it, it's like, well, progress happened, right? You know, because people weren't thinking about the site the way we think about it today. What was the different? What what made the difference? People that were now able to have more leisure time. So a group of descendants, an organization of women, got together and saved the Long Barrett. The state bought the church in 1883 for $20,000. And they handed it over to the city, said, hey, use it as whatever you want. And then when the DRT bought the Long Barrett and deeded it to the state, the state then said, this is going to be a sacred memorial to the heroes that immolated themselves upon that hallowed ground. And so it's been a memorial since 1905. Somebody else over here? Go ahead. I'm just curious, has there been thought given to traveling exhibitions of some of the things that you can't display in the Alamo? There is, is talk about it. Like this, for example? There is some talk about it. We have done things on a smaller scale. So a couple of us have traveled for around the state with some of our collection, showing it to people. In 2018, we did a different version of that. We did the what was known as the Alamo Roadshow, and we traveled all over the state of Texas in a in a bus. We hosted Roadshow too here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we did that, and that was fun. Have you ever been in a uh, in a? They call it a luxury limo, but it's really not. It's more like. Uh, that vehicle that they take you from the airport to your car. <laughs> and so imagine going on one of those from here or from San Antonio to El Paso. <laughs> and then from El Paso North. So we traveled all over the state talking to people, trying to bring the plan that we were working on back then, trying to get it into the people of Texas so that they would know what we were doing. 
And we also looked at people's collections and talked about their collections and what they had and how they could preserve them. And we took their stories as well. You know, everybody has a story. And so someone's family line may help us answer a question that we've been trying to figure out for years. So we did that. And uh, we, who knows? We may be going on the road show again. We never know. <laughs> so, but it is, uh, you know, our collection. We will be hopefully able to loan things out more often to museums that can use something that we cannot display because that's the way that we're able to showcase what we have in a different light. If any of you, uh, Ernesto was kind enough to come tonight. We thought he was going to have time to stay here tonight and make this easy on him, but he's actually duty calls. He's got to be back at work tomorrow. So we'll have, I'm not saying questions are over. If you have things you want to ask, we still got a few minutes, but we'll probably be wrapping up pretty quickly. I promise to get him fed before he goes back on the road, so we'll probably <laughs> slip out pretty quickly. But if you want to come up and ask, talk to him personally for a couple of minutes, I'm sure we've got a little time. If you want to make a donation to our friends to help us keep doing these events going forward, there's a box in the back. Our gift shop is still open as you transition. But we'll take the last few questions. We appreciate you coming out. Like I said, we take August off, so we don't do a History of Night program in August because it's too hot in August, right? It feels great today. Uh, and then uh, we'll be back in September with the program I mentioned to you about Henry Fanthorpe. Anybody else have questions for Ernesto? Like I said, we'll break. If you want to come up and chat with him for a minute, that's great. We appreciate you coming out.